Hello, welcome to this Tales from the Hut and Hanger episode on the Spitfire Mark 26 with pilot Rick Lee. Rick, as you are here in this episode, detests flying along with other stuff during the Mark 26's development. Rick also touches on the Mark 26 in his podcast series we did about his aviation career. You can find the links in the description of this episode. This is along with other things mentioned during today's conversation. All the photos are Rick's unless otherwise stated. Um, this lovely picture on the screen you can see is from an EAA Sport Aviation magazine and a, a fantastic photograph by Jim Kaponik and uh, that's Rick you can see in the, uh, in the cockpit. The video footage used in this episode features Rick flying the Mark 26. This footage is for Logan Fort's video channel on YouTube and I fully recommend you watch it. Uh, the link for this is also in this episode's description and we're going to start with that as Rick lays down the uh, the story of his involvement with the Mark 26. Right, hello Rick again. Oh. <laughs> hello Keith. So, yeah, this is your story and uh, experiences and adventures with the Spitfire Mark 26. Yes, it's uh, it was very lucky. Uh, it started in 2000. Uh, and I was in Australia visiting a gliding base uh, out in, uh, not far from Brisbane, and I went out to swing a tiger moth's uh, prop to, so he could take off. And on the way out, the gentleman said to me, oh, you're a pom? I said, yeah. He said, uh, did you know there's an Aussie building a Spitfire in anger not far from where you're messing around with the hawker hunters? And I went, really? He said, yeah. Your eyes lit up. Yeah, that's right. He said, they're real aluminium. They're all just like the real thing. So I said, oh, okay. And swung the tiger moth and off he flew. And the very next day, I was in the hangar at a place called Archerfield, which is a, an airfield uh, almost in the middle of Brisbane. Uh, it was used in the Second World War and it had been surrounded by... Uh, houses and buildings and shops and things um but there was an airfield there and uh, it was ho housing a mark uh, 9 hunter um which i was getting prepared to do the air test we'd bought 20 a gentleman had bought 20 of them off the Aust australian air force off the sorry singapore air force anyway i remembered what this gentleman said and i walked 200 yards down the road to another hangar um across the main road in a building area a site and as I walked into this complex, I could see a door, sliding door open, and there were five or six men building aeroplanes inside there, aluminium aeroplanes. And sure enough, they looked like Spitfires. Um, and a gentleman approached me, a chap called Mike Sullivan, a big tall bloke, and there were three other people working on these aircraft. And uh, he said, come into the office. And I said, I, you're obviously the man that's building these Spitfires. And he said, yes, the Mark 25. He said, I've already got four or five of them flying and there's another four out there that are going to go to the public. And I said, wow, that's fantastic. And we sat down in an office which was surround All the walls and the cabinets were full of Spitfire books and pictures. And he told me his background and he said he'd lived out bush, his father, on a few thousand acres. And after the war, his father had bought two beaten up spitfires full of fuel he bought them for the fuel and over the years when he was a teenager they slowly deteriorated and he learned to fly but always wanted to fly a spitfire and he decided in his early 20s that he was going to build one and i was quite impressed at what he'd said and he said what's your association with spitfires and, and airplanes and i told him that i'd spent some years in the RAF and that i'd formation on real Spitfires on Battle of Britain days when I was flying Jaguars and other things and sat in a real one when in 1967 when the, the British RAF um, Battle of Britain flight had just started in a hangar behind the Coltishall one where we were flying lightnings and I remember sitting in a Spitfire then and thinking wow I'd love to fly one of these <laughs> and um so that was the start. A chap called Rick Groombridge was, was flying the, the, I think it was the only Spitfire they had then. Um, anyway, so here I was, uh, and he was talking about Spitfires, and he said, well, um, come outside and have a look at what we're doing. And as we walked out, there was another one, another 
model that was being built and it was slightly longer than the Mark 25 Spitfire which had a six cylinder Jabiru engine in it um, and this other one was going to be a two seater. He was very a bit reluctant to say too much about it because he didn't really know me from Adam. Uh, anyway he said I intend to try and put a 12 cylinder engine in it in fact two six cylinder Jabiru's back to back and have about 300 horsepower and I went Wow. He said, yeah, well, uh, there's a chap up in Bundaberg who's making these Jabiru engines, six cylinders, and they're flying and they're beautiful engines. And they are. They're very sm smooth. And I, I spent a lot of time flying the Mark VI in Jabiru aircraft, the six cylinder engine. Anyway, that all fell through. And he had to, um, in fact, agree to making an eight cylinder engine from the Mark 26. OK, so that's a bit of background. He immediately said to me, well, look, if I build this two-seater Spitfire, this Mark 26, would would you be interested in flying it and test flying it? And I went, gosh, yes, to, you know, of course I would. I'd love to. Thank you, Mike. And he said, well, if you'd like to come out to this little airstrip where we're doing flying with other light aircraft. And he gave me a position of this place called Bradfield, which is about 50 miles inland. Uh, and... So he said, you're going to have to get a light aircraft um, certificate to fly these aeroplanes. And I'd had to renew one. And this I did. I did it within a few months flying light aircraft. I didn't really know, having already agreed that I'd love to fly his Spitfires, just how good they were, having survived nearly at the age of 56 uh, jets and other light aircraft. I was keen to fly anything, but I had to make sure that this aeroplane was going to be relatively safe so i suppose really after you flew the mosquito at that time <laughs> you never thought you'd have a chance of that no, no, and exactly. all these years later oh yeah you got a chance of a, a new variant of the spitfire absolutely which, uh, so it's quite incredible really in yeah, your career, isn't it? I, I drove out in my land rover to this airfield which was called the birdman squadron he told me <laughs> and he gave me intricate details on how to get into this rather quiet and secret little strip uh, 50 miles inland from brisbane um, you had to drive a, an Atkinson Road along along a straight Atkinson Road in the bush bushland, and you come to a gate by a post, park your car, get out, jump over the gate, go to the third fir tree on the right. Under a stone, you'll find a key. <laughs> well, I did all this, and and I jumped back over the gate and unlocked it. <coughs> he said, "Make sure you lock the gate behind you when you come in." I drove through about half a mile of trees and then I opened up into a space uh, next to a large, a bit uh, rumble down hangar, quite a large hangar, uh, against all. Uh, and the next little thing was, was caravans. There was three caravans, a couple of tents, light aircraft were pushing their little noses out of these tents. Uh, and there were four guys sitting around the table and they all welcomed me and I sat down and we ummed and ahed a little bit. And then Mike said, well... Um, would you like to have a look at a Mark 25 Spitfire, the ones that you saw being made in the factory? And he lifted up a sheet and um, there underneath was this lovely little single-seater Spitfire. The, um, he gave me a quick briefing on it. He said, would you like to fly that? And I said, yeah, do birds piss in the woods? Yes, I said, I'd love to. <laughs> so he pushed it out. It had a six-cylinder Jabiru engine. He gave me a few details on how to start it, obviously, and bits and pieces. Um, and the undercarriage was the big problem. It was an over-centering lever on the right-hand side, about two feet high, which, as you got airborne, you had to put slightly zero G on, on the undercarriage system, on the aircraft, and then move the lever uh, forwards to bring the gear up. And it was through a, um, a gearing system, which automatically locked when you pushed the lever fully forward. I had problems with that, but I took off. Uh, I climbed to about three or 4,000 feet in this little Spitfire. And within a few minutes, I realized that this aeroplane was one of the most beautiful little aircraft with this uh, 120 horsepower engine that I'd ever flown. Um, and I'd flown quite a few chipmunks and, mm -hmm. and osters and things. So I did some aerobatics. I didn't realize that at that time nobody had done anything particularly there was no snap rolls or anything loops or wing overs as barrel rolls and mike was down below in the middle of the strip watching me and i landed with a big grin on my face um but with no power on the instrumentation for some reason all the electrics the engine kept running had gone off and i slid the canopy back and he stood next to me he looked down he said what do you think and i said fantastic but why has all the power gone off 
and he leaned into the little cockpit and turned the power switch which had got, turned itself off under the 3G I'd been pulling. And he lift, lifted it up he's, <laughs> and he said, I'll change the position of that. And I said, can I go up again? And I did another 15 minutes flying the Mark 25 Spitfire. So when I got back down on the ground again, this time I said to Mike, that is an amazing little aeroplane. How did you get it to f operate like I would imagine a Spitfire to fly? And he said, well, it took me a long time, but I had to make a Mark 24 and a half. And I said, what's that? <laughs> and he said, oh, well, if you knew your Spitfires, Rick, you know they stopped making them on the Mark 24. And I went, oh, uh, yes, OK. And then he said, but I've got a 24 and a half, he said, which came, and there's only one of them. Um, and he said, I built this. It's got a 25 horsepower Hearth engine in it. And I built it out of aluminium with a fixed undercarriage, but it was the wing that I wanted to put on my Spitfire Mark 25 and eventually to Mark 26. And he said, I learned how to construct that, uh, the way that the Spitfire will, wing is built in, in aluminium uh, with the same uh, system inside the wing, the uh, square inside square and the strength and everything that the Spitfire was known for. And he said, and this is a picture of it. And I said, where is it? He said, well, I'm not too happy about the whole shape of it, he said. But that gave me the, the strength to go on and, and make the Mark 25. Amazing. Uh, and I eventually found it, and it was sitting underneath a, a tarp about five miles away. And Mike has kept it hidden. And it was an amazing little aeroplane. I flew past it in a biplane doing about or 85 knots and the guy put the power on and it just shot off it could literally even that little picture as you can see there with that little hearth engine it it flew extremely well and extremely fast because of that amazing wing spitfire wing so that's the beginning of the mark 25 um and you'll see another picture there of the engine which is the jabiru six cylinder correction uh, that's the uh, mark 26 engine uh, the Mark 25 engine has only got six cylinders. Right. So uh, we're now into the Mark 26. Um, he stopped building the Mark 25 about a year after I um, joined the company, if you like. And um, the Mark 26 was finished. The eight cylinder engine you see there was made specifically for the Mark 26 as, in fact, Rod Stiff, the man who owned the factory up in Bunberg, made a lot of money out of building the six-cylinder Jabiru engine, which went into the Mark 25. Uh, and he sold that all around the world. And you can still buy six-cylinder Jabiru engines and eight-cylinder engines. The picture, the next picture you see is the Mark 26 Spitfire, some eight or nine months later, being pushed out of the factory uh, doors, as you can see behind it, and doing its its engine run with the eight cylinder installed, um, and before it went onto the trailer and taken out to Bradfield uh, to do its first flights. In fact, it didn't go out to Bradfield. It went out to a place called Watts Bridge. We didn't have enough room at Bradfield, stuck out in the woods there. So we actually took it out in the next picture, which uh, you'll see, which is a red Land Rover, Defender, which was mine from my balloon business that I'd basically just uh, wrapped up. And it's towing the trailer belonging to Mike, designed for the Mark 26 Spitfire. Uh, it's the two-seater. The Mark 25, as you'll probably know, is a single-seater, so it's longer. <clears throat> and, um, and it folds up and you can get it up or the wings come off and you can stick it on a trailer. It takes about 20 minutes. Okay then, Rick. So we got a great picture here of uh, obviously the aircraft taxi now. Who's in the picture with you? Yeah, there's uh, me and my son at the back. I'm on the left. My son's on the other side uh, as Mike taxis out for the first solo in the Mark 26. So was it early in the morning or late at night? Or? I think we got there in my Land Rover around about uh, 11 o'clock. We were really keen. There weren't many people around. Um, and Mike obviously didn't want too much of a crowd, so it would probably be on a Sunday morning, oh, something right, like okay. that. Or, uh, yeah. So the next photograph is obviously a carry-on yeah. from that, is it? Yeah, it is. And there's a gentleman on the wing. Um, I think he's one of the guys that worked in the factory. Uh, we were a little bit uh, wary of the brakes, which had no obviously never been tested that before, and taxing. So we were making absolutely certain they got out to the end of the runway, which was fine. And Mike took off and did a couple of circuits and landed. And then uh, I had a go, and, and I flew it next. Brilliant. And this nice... is taken some a little bit time later, probably the first air-to-air -air shot of the Mark 26, 
Uh, Mike's flying it, and I'm in a Jabiru, two-seater side-by-side, the four-cylinder Jabiru engine. And at this stage, we've taken the aeroplane up to Bundaberg, as you can see on, on the side there. Where's that is, near in big city terms? Yeah, it's, it's about uh, 120 kilometres north of Brisbane area. Oh, and right. it's where the engines um, were made and the Jabiru aircraft are made. And it's where I did the later spin trials. All oh, right, great. This is me back at um, Birdman Squadron out at Bradfield. Uh, there we did a lot of flying to test and the engine with different propellers. Uh, we were still looking at the performance. We tried two blade, a variable pitch, uh, four bladers, and we had various ways of, of changing the uh, pitch of the blades. Oh. Yeah. Right, so going on to propellers, you said there's lots of different ones you used. Um. Yes, I think this was the biggest challenge uh, of all, and um, my propeller theory isn't that good, but I learned a lot with Mike Sullivan, and various people offered to produce variable pitch. Uh, we had a, a couple of two-bladed props which spun like crazy, um, and they exceeded the RPM we wanted. Um, we tried three-bladers, four-bladers, a variable pitch device by a gentleman who you'll see in the probably in the next picture. Um, he came from uh, New Zealand. Um, he, he's actually built something inside the hub at the base of each propeller, yeah. and it was electrically um, moved by a single switch in the cockpit, an up and down switch, which had ten seconds up and ten seconds down, and. Uh, in the middle it was at basic thrust and then by putting it up it coarsened and by pushing it down it went finer unfortunately there was no gauge to see exactly where the last pilot or in my case uh, you had to remember when you started moving it because uh, you couldn't see the propeller that well from inside the cockpit it was so a distance um oh. if so this photograph here then, uh, what's this, just to check after a flight or pre-flight? Yeah, we, we were having a few problems um, with cockpit trim and bits and pieces, and I'm not quite sure what, what we were doing, but Mike, uh, oh, I think he's got the engine um, off on this one, the engine cowling, mm. and we're, we're fiddling around with something inside the engine. I was interested, but not quite sure what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a picture of the two-bladed prop. You can see that the other one uh, on the other picture was, was more. This is a very... Um, later on, we found that um, we were having big problems with these automatic devices that change the variable pitch of the propeller. Um, and we decided to go back to the two-bladed props uh, for the spin trials. And you can see that the back of the aeroplane there is a, a tube and it took me a little bit of design, but basically what I did was I, I got an aluminium tube, um, put it through, put the tail wheel through the middle of the tube, mm. uh, and at the, the rest of it, which stuck out about a foot and a half, two foot, um, inside was 15 metres of nylon cord. Uh, there were two cords that went up into the cockpit, and I had two levers on either side of the cockpit, the left one actually um, released a parachute which came out of a, a lampshade in the 1950s. If you'd have been working in a factory in Birmingham, you'd have seen these green lampshades <laughs> above your head. <laughs> and I spotted one in a, in a factory and got it. And I put in a, a tail chute from a hunter uh, extraction chute and I fitted it into inside this uh, lampshade, mm. made a, a, a fiberglass lid to it. And then I had two yacht type release mechanisms are inside the tube at the back connected by uh, nylon cord to the two levers by pulling the left lever it took out a, a pin on top of the aluminium cap over the lampshade which allowed a spring to push the lid away and out shot the parachute on a 15 yard uh, piece of uh, nylon oh, right. uh, and this was going to be my anti-spin shoot uh, to release it uh, the other lever on the right again opened a another a, a yacht release system uh, where we pulled on a stainless steel thing on the inside the tube and that released the 15 meters of of nylon cord 
Okay, Rick, so get on to this picture here with uh, you having a chat with the ground crew, as it were. What's well, going on? yeah, this was another one where I probably got as close to crashing as I've ever been in the Spitfire Mark 26, apart from two obvious crashes you'll see later on when the engines quit. I'd just been doing a propeller, the one that this gentleman in the red shirt on the left of the, behind the trailing edge of the wing, it's a New Zealand guy who'd had this electrical system where you could press the switch up and down and have 10 seconds of the variable pitch. I took over the aeroplane about an hour earlier from Mike, who'd flown it with the variable pitch, and he didn't have time to debrief me about where he'd left the switch. And I'd taxied out to the end of the runway, the strip, which is about 500 yards behind the aeroplane. And I'd taken off and run the the switch uh, up through about five seconds. Mike had told me he'd left it in the fully course position. And I wanted it somewhere in between fully fine and fully course for the takeoff, which worked best. Anyway, I ran down the runway and I realised after I got to about 65 knots that the propeller was not in the position position of the pitch that I wanted and I wasn't going to get any more speed from mm. the engine. And it was too late to stop and I tried to get the switch to caution it, uh, to caution the actual uh, propeller um, and I only just managed about a two foot, they reckon, over the fence at the end of the runway where there was a road behind. If anything bigger than a Mini had been going along the road, I would have hit it. The aeroplane never got above um, about 65, 70 knots. I couldn't climb. I couldn't change the pitch of the propeller. Whatever had happened in the hub had broken. And I then slalomed in between various gum trees, literally 20, 30, 40 feet above me, round about 10 or 15 feet in a big flat turn using mostly tiny bits of rudder yeah. to come back and land the other way across the strip, which is where I'm facing now. And I came back from where I took off and landed. They None of the people in the field could see me because I was so low. <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't land. Uh, the undercarriage was still down. Uh, I didn't want to do anything but just quietly get round in a, a 180 degree round the fields and mm. come back. It was really quite frightening. And this is still the look on my face when I got back from the other end of the airfield and I taxied up and they said, what happened? Because they didn't know where <laughs> I'd gone. They thought I'd landed in a field somewhere. Um, and we immediately realised that the hubs inside the propeller on this particular occasion, and they'd all failed. They just oh, wouldn't right. go coarse or fine. It was just stuck. Um, so that was the end of that particular system. And my son was there, and, and I'm actually talking to the gentleman saying, I'm sorry, mate, but uh, it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> <laughs> right, nice. so get on to this other nice photograph. Bit, yeah, I'm a bit happier there. Um, the gentleman, I think this was the day before when, when the two-blader had worked, but... Um, we, we we didn't use that system. My three sons there from the left is Luke, Matty and Chris. They're all in their um, 20s now, 25, kids and got wives. And Jim, of course, is uh, my son who flew with me quite a few times in the back seat of the Spitfire later on, the Mark 26B. And the same with Mike, Matty and Chris. They all... Is Jim the one that went up in the... Uh... Jaguar, was it? Jaguar or Hunter? Yes, oh, you, you, yes. The guy, right. Jim, the youngest my, man of my eldest son, when I was in Oman and I ejected, he... he Which is a, in another story by <laughs> Rick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he'd flown in the Jaguar when I was in Oman. And, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a nice photograph, that. Really good. Yeah, sons and grandsons. Okay, this is very intriguing. So uh, it's been yeah, this was my, <laughs> my first prang, and it could have been one of the others, and I would have been probably a bit naughtier than this one. But I'd... I'd actually just been up to uh, just under 15,000 feet. I'd started to get a little bit of hypoxia. Basically, I was, I was doing long-distance trials, uh, fuel flow trials um, at Watfield, and I would spend, you know, I was, did over 40 or 50 hours of all sorts of different engine testing and different mm. props. And on this particular occasion, uh, I'd gone out there from Birdman Squadron to get some more fuel. The only place where we could get our fuel was at Watts Bridge, where we had a a card and a you know money on on the company 
card and I'd landed after a, an hour and a half, filled up with fuel, taxied out to the end of the strip. Was, there was very little wind, um, but it was long enough to get airborne. And I did all the normal things, everything fine. I had the flaps down and literally I'd just lifted off, heading from left to right in the photograph. Uh, and literally I was just about to bring the undercarriage up mm. which takes 10 seconds and I was at about 15 feet and the engine just cut completely right um, it had taxied out quite a long way so the fuels were all on and my checks were done and the engine quit and it actually just settled back onto the runway it had just stopped completely right but but I was two-thirds away down the runway and going towards a very large fence it was only about three or four foot high but they were about two foot across these posts with strong wire and then barbed wire and fixed wire and to hit it as somebody quite a few people have done it was literally a end over end type thing it would have ruined the airplane so i touched down again with the engine stopped um uh, with about 40 40 50 yards to go for this fence mm. and i wasn't going to be able to stop the airplane so I ground looped it. I, I put full left rudder and tried to get onto the gliding strip, which is behind that truck. Yeah. But unfortunately, there was a drain to keep the rain when the rains go in New South Wales. And that drain is about 15 feet across. And you no, can see where the water runs. And I hadn't forgotten about the drain. I just couldn't remember just how steep it was. I'd never sort of thought that I'd ever have to go across it in a Spitfire at 60 knots. <laughs> like but you do. Anyway, um, so... I'm heading towards it. I've probably got about 80 metres before I came to the, the gap. And I, I saw the gap and I realised by then I was travelling at about 30 knots. The nose of the aeroplane went down and you can see where the prop and the wheels on the other side. It broke the prop, uh, pushed one wheel up, I think, the right wheel. Uh, and I stopped quite quickly from about 35 knots. Very upset. Um, the engine obviously was, was stopped. Um, there was nobody else there, actually. There was a couple of the chalets who got people in, but they were fast asleep uh, or they didn't come out. And I phoned Mike and I said, Mike, we've had an engine failure on takeoff and uh, I need a truck. He was always very good about my pranks in the Spitfire. <laughs> he said, oh, I'll be there soon. And he brought a truck and we lifted it up and we fixed the undercarriage pretty quickly and uh, the prop. Uh, and we found out the problem with the... We did have a lot of problems with the uh, the Jabiru uh, carburetors. They were like Bing carburetors, and, and if you didn't uh, get an even flow, one mm. would stop and then the engine would stop. But this oh. was a, uh, a blockage in the, in the fuel system. So quite a lucky escape then, really. Yeah, in a way. Right, so it's a lovely shot, really nice photograph of the, uh, the Spitfire. Um I still got to question the silver spinner. <laughs> Should have oh, been yes. black. No, it looks yeah. really nicely proportioned in it. Obviously, with the the longer nose, um, gave it away a bit to, I suppose, Spitfire experts. If you saw a distance, but yeah, you just see those wings and just go, oh, it's a Spitfire. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, so, what was this a, a sort of a aero shoot you did that yeah. day, or that things things changed from that picture. Um, uh, we we went on to that picture maybe and that is now the engine has changed completely it's got another would you believe um 150 horsepower um and the actual development of the mark 26 it became the 26 b b for bigger and what happened was he gave us a little bit more room he, he extended the fuselage by i think it was about 80 or 90 centimeters um, and the aeroplane um, had a much bigger engine. We had problems with the Jabiru very um, early on with the um The precautions were really good on that, didn't they, I yeah, think? Yeah, that, that is probably when the better one. When you look at the one previous. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about the Tiger Tooth, uh, no, the Shark uh, Tooth. So I think it, it spoils it slightly Americanized, but the Americans love that. They had it on their Mustangs. Yeah, that's right. Um, Tom Hawks, but. Right. We found that you're now looking at a blade, which is a four-bladed prop. Um, I think the ultimate machine was went from your Jabiru's uh, eight-cylinder, 
we then went to the engine which I preferred, which was the Isuzu. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was a Honda engine, which Isuzu made under license. Yeah, like they do trucks. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. And that was a 260 horsepower, maybe a little bit more, uh, 300 horsepower, depending on thing. And that was... Um, a fantastic engine I, uh, that was a, a truck engine but you could put the throttle in the top left hand corner and leave it there until you've run out of fuel and it would sit at about 215 knots and and it just was quite incredible how that engine and it still does behave on on mike's um own gearbox yeah. and then more people wanted more power as they have done in various and they put in an eight cylinder 450 horsepower engine which was truly fantastic it climbed at about four and a half to five thousand feet per minute on a good day cool and um that was almost better than the the real spitfire to be honest but of course it didn't weigh five ton no <laughs> this thing weighed you know because i'm right in my limited knowledge it was 90 percent built similar to the original spitfire wasn't it but oh very is, much so was it not what's the it, it's, um, ratio was it, it went from 75 up to 85 to about 90 odd because okay. i did wonder about the undercarriage whether they actually made the track wider than the normal spitfire i don't know the a good question obviously it wasn't as wide you know by meters but uh, it certainly didn't feel uncomfortable because the only thing i think about a spitfire when you see it that looks yeah. not right is the the width of the undercarriage probably because you see hurricanes with their yes, lovely broad exactly or the measure smits actually went yeah, further out but the spitfires like if you redid really the spitfire you'd yeah. move those that undercarriage out a little bit well you? i must admit i felt a little bit worried about it when i first started flying it um and obviously australia is a good place to fly because you don't get this sort of winds we get mm. in the uk um and i did do quite a bit of flying in the uk and was caught by a crosswind uh, delivering a, a mark 26 with the isuzu engine mm. um with the owner in the back and we flew all the way from northern england down to just north of london and the airfield i was trying to get into had this um, squall coming in uh, speeds up to 25 knots crosswind and it literally just as I was on approach the, you could see the the windsock change and as I touched down I was hit by a, a very strong 25 knot crosswind and it literally just ground looped almost and I just missed, missed the, my left wing tip and I turned off the runway after about 200 metres not by because I wanted to because the wind made me so uh, yeah the, the undercarriage didn't collapse it mm. was very close to it I think yeah but, um, so anyway I think that looks a better proportioned aircraft in general yeah. apart from the, uh, the shark yeah. teeth it looks uh, really good in that shot yeah, it, it looked good Brilliant. So, right, OK, we're moving on to America now. Right. That's a cracking shot as well. Um, this was the Mark 26B with the uh, original engine in, and it was bought by a chap called Craig Muth. Um, his son was uh, called Robert Jacob Muth, RJM, after the <laughs> RJM on the side of the aeroplane. And it was bought by the American dealer, and it was put in a box, and it was flown over, and... Mike and I and my wife and uh, another gentleman went over to to America to the Sun and Fun, mm. Florida. But I will just mention that uh, Rick's gone into this in a little bit of detail um, in a previous podcast yeah. of his so, aviation well, career. So uh, we'll duplicate some of it here now, but that's uh, yeah. a bit of a story of that. And also while we're on the subject, Rick, we will show on the screen now oh, yeah, that, one. that wonderful front cover oh, dear. Uh, yeah. with your little smiling face, <laughs> which I think is a cracking photo. And it's fun, yeah. actually. I, I went on in the internet today and I found a better quality version of this. Oh, cool. Um, to, uh, which is on the screen now. So uh, it's just a bit sharper yeah. and looks neater. Um, but yeah, that's a really well, good photograph. That I must admit, I felt very privileged to to have flown it at, at the air show, mm. and uh, a lot of people liked it. it. Took a couple of years for the Americans to accept it, and of course, Mike's got his factory there now, uh, in Texas. Um, so, how many do they knock out a year? Do they, they... I'm not sure whether he's he's actually still knocking them out. Um, I know that uh, there's quite a few f kits flying around the world in various countries. But um, Mike, uh, I, I don't know whether Mike is still getting orders, to be honest. 
I need to check So it, it was really nice taking it to America and they're impressed with it, basically. Yeah, I, I think they were. I, I, they, they, they had, I think I mentioned in another podcast, I said the RVs were fiberglass. Well, they're not. My, they're all made out of aluminium, most are RVs. And, and he was trying to emulate them. And, of course, they, they sold many thousands of them. So you're obviously paid by the company, were you, for this work? No, no. The only a... thing I ever took off Mike was the, that originally that little biplane that got me the yeah. license again, and I flew that and I gave it to a friend and and I and I enjoyed that. I, I felt very privileged to be able to fly it. Yeah, it's, I'm sure you did. I just, just wondered yeah, and, how far it progressed. But also, you said that you weren't you were a test pilot in a way with this aircraft, but you weren't on paper a no, test pilot. No, I, I, I no, I hadn't gone through Boscombe down, um, <laughs> but. You know, it was very much a feely feely type thing, and I wrote articles Pilot about it and stuff. Yeah, you know, the things you had to do, checks and the spinning trial and everything like that. So, and even now, I went the other day to look at a, an aeroplane out at Henstridge, which is um, about to be tested, flight tested. Um, and the thing about spinning is, and it's very important because we've just lost somebody who, who died recently and, and what they think was a spin, mm. was that what a lot of people did to their Spitfires, and I don't blame them, they put guns on them, you know, fiberglass guns on the wing. They they did little ancillaries to make it look more like the real thing. Yeah. And I said very early on in my spin test trials, that would change how the aerodynamics of the airplane would be. That critical. It, it would be that critical in mm. an airplane like this. Any form of changing that that sh- shape of the air across the wing could make it be more difficult to recover or it would be more prone to be going left or right or whatever. So d- the drag of that aeroplane that you see there and the spinning trials that I did w- were very predictable. And anything other than that shape needs to be done all over again. Otherwise, somebody's going to get into trouble. Right, so moving on to this really nice photograph of... Uh... A nice silhouette of it, which looks like a genuine Spitfire taking off. <laughs> it does, more obscure. And that's at uh, Watts Bridge, uh, spit testing. It, it wasn't designed to land in the dark. We didn't have any night lights on it, but um, got down just before. No doubt it was lighter le- than the photograph showing. Cause <laughs> yes, that's legality. Kind of um, parameters you give yourself. Yeah, but, uh, yeah it's a really I'm, nice I'm photograph. not sure whether it's Mike or me there. <laughs> okay. Um this is nice angle as well. Um, yeah, it looks as if the propeller. Can you see a propeller on that? Spinning, yeah. Oh yes, yeah, just a spinner it's there. Spinning, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's me in the original at um, the Birdman Squadron. Uh, it it was quite exciting flying there, um, and I have got my Mirage Australian Air Force Bone Dome on. Very good. <laughs> but Very good. Uh, it was something that saved a friend of mine uh, but i basically gave my little biplane to a friend called jimmy hull who actually made the spitfires in yorkshire um about four or five years before that and he was the first man to fly in the mark 26 in the back seat with me mm. up at a place called sherburn in Elmet when uh, <clears throat> we brought them to england and we were trying to demonstrate it to a, a group of people who uh, had heard about this kit Spitfire in Australia but didn't believe a word that it could do aerobatics and do all these things. Well, I came over with Mike to try and convince people that what they'd heard was true. And, and I was at um, Sherbin in Elmet and the horns came out. I think the CAA has taught on to find me and <laughs> arrest me. But anyway, I, I I basically lost it a little bit because I decided that I was going to demonstrate how the aeroplane could be, you know, flown reasonably aerobatically, no flick rolls or anything. And I went up, first of all, solo at Sherbin in Elmet with two people with their checkbooks out saying, well, we've heard all this stuff on the internet, but can it really do what it says? Mm. And I went up there and I did a few overhead two or three thousand feet did some loops and a barrel roll and things came back down and they said well uh, can it be done with anybody in the back so i put jimmy hull in the back and we did a nice gentle maneuvers around the airfield again and the two guys wrote checks for them so it worked uh, you're you're yeah, a salesman it yeah works. yeah but i had to get out of the country pretty quick before the ca <laughs> realized it. no that wasn't quite the case no because, of course um, not. 
Yeah. Well, and there's this cracking shot here. Of a nice yeah. Low level, Again, uh, we're back in Australia here with the original Mark uh, Twenty Six, and uh, it, it's a film that you can see on the. It's about two thousand and two, two thousand and one, something like that. And uh, we had Mike Sullivan. When you get the video on the television, you'll see Mike Sullivan crouch down with his head between his knees. And the gentleman taking these photographs is a chap called uh, uh, Terry Pronk, who, uh, who um, actually had a an American um, Mustang. And he, he and I used to fly together in formation. And yeah. uh, he was a great friend of... Um, Mike Sullivan, but unfortunately he had an engine failure on takeoff on his own private strip in the um, aeroplane, the V8, which he had in his uh, aeroplane, the American Mustang. Mm. And he crashed into a, a gully at the end of the strip and it caught fire. And he wasn't wearing a hard helmet and two or three other people were killed in light aircraft uh, and and one in, a, in an actual Spitfire, I think. And they weren't wearing the heavy helmets that we flew in the military and I did all my test flying with a military bone dome on it might look a bit over the top but um, yeah and it saved the life of a friend of mine who bought one off the internet and he crashed a little biplane it wasn't his fault the engine had failed but he managed to get it back into his strip out bush and as it hit the ground it exploded in flames and uh, his wife and I rushed out to this burning airplane and I just thought that was the end of Jimmy Hull, the man mm. who had built Spitfires and so on with me. And he walked out from behind the, the smoke like... <laughs> uh, top Gun. <laughs> top Gun. <laughs> with, with, took his helmet off and said, Jesus, and there was a big dent in the helmet where it cracked the fiberglass. Oh, wow. And as it hit the ground, he'd gone forward and he would have been unconscious and had died in the flames. Wow. And I think it's a lesson which a lot of you know people thought it was a bit over the top. But I used to fly with a... A motorcycle hat on yeah. the little biplane, and, and we know the story like about gloves, don't we? And gloves, yeah. Of you know, I mean, there's nothing. Go back to a previous episode for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so no. moving on to this next photograph, oh, okay. uh, a nice aerial shot again of. Uh, oh yes, you uh, doing the business. That's got the insignia on of the boxing kangaroo and uh, oh, yeah. submarine aircraft, and it, Mike had gone to a lot of trouble to to get the right permissions to build this aeroplane and call it a you know and, and there were a lot of people that you know yeah i'm sure there were. knocked it the finish said, is really good though when you look it up uh, close if if nobody's flown it you can't knock it it no, really was and i've flown some fantastic aeroplanes and uh you know sports aeroplanes and all sorts of things but the spitfire is really just something about it that just just grabs you um and this is uh, a silly picture of me, which shows <laughs> complete situational awareness. Yes, um, um, that's your natural look, there, Rick. Yeah. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I look a lot it better makes than me I do laugh now. Anyway, but yeah, anyway, I... less of that because we want to make you look professional. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a bit more Aussie ca yeah, casual I, pose. I, I wish I was that weight again. I must be around oh, no, about seventy-five kilos there. The flaps were brilliant on on the spinny. It, you could really do what you see the Spitfires do in the Second World War. No straight in approaches. You can do that lovely cur yeah. you know, curving turn and, and see field. the end of the runway where you want to touch Almost down. Almost like birds land on a lake, aren't yeah, they, in some ways? Th it, you could do it in that. And there's a nice four-bladed mm. uh, propeller. Which Very short works. props. Mm. Yeah, it's a really nice photograph. That's Watts Bridge. Uh, and that's a nice angle as well. With yeah. The, uh, you can Soul see shoot. the 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 shoot thing. You can see how close it was. Now imagine a a large green lampshade with, yeah. with a parachute in it. You can see how close that would be to the runway. It was one inch above the runway, standing like that. So when I came into land, I would always do a wheeler when I was doing the spinning trials, and then very gently lower the the tail uh, when I was you know going slowly. Um, I don't didn't once catch it, but. Um, it was very close to the runway. Worked yeah, a treat. I felt and now like we've got it. a really nice rural... Um... Yeah, these shed here on the right, uh, this is Bird's, uh, Bird, Birdman Squadron or Bradfield. Mm. If you go on to Google Earth and you, you've, you can find it still. I had a look at it this morning. There's two or three aeroplanes there now, big twin-engine en twin aeroplanes. Um, but it, it's still a good strip. Um, Brings back yeah. lots of memories. And the second one of the same uh, 
Yeah. Same shot with the tractor. It's, Country. Uh, As I say, we, we did it secluded. We didn't want to do all our sort of more risky flying yeah. next to the public, so we did it out bush. Yeah, you can certainly uh, get the atmosphere of that bush place. Can't there you? were three airfields within Cooey of that strip at Bradfield. Um, so it, there was me- method in our madness. They were all actually owned by people who worked for Mike. Where oh, right. Bradfield was very convenient. So you had lots of there places was, to go if you had problems. Yeah, there, and... we, we could get in within, I could be up at two or 3,000 feet in an engine ferry and I could get into John's place or Fred's place or Pete's place. And there was one guy who had a lovely strip and he made all the undercarriage legs and he flew um, auto gyros. Oh, right, uh, yeah. And he would he he did the, all the machining uh, of the undercarriage. All oh, right. And it was built very similar to the real Spitfire, where all the engineering places in the war were all spread out and all came together and went up to, you know, Coventry and 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 built the Spitfire. So Mike's Spitfire was done very much the same. All oh, right. Okay. And so my son and three grandsons actually built later on, about five or six years down the line from the picture you saw them earlier. Mm. They were doing riveting. Uh, the, the holes were already made, and they were taught how to build the tailplane and the fins. All oh, right. My good. son made all the exhausts for the for the um, Mark Twenty Six uh, sta- in uh, stainless steel. So it's a bit of a family affair then. We, then. Yeah, we had our own workshop where we helped Mike. Great. Mm-hmm. And then moving on to another a very elegant picture of it, really. Yeah, if you look at the back there, you'll see the tailwheel is tied down to a spike in the ground there. You can see the rope going to it. It's like engine runs, isn't and it? That, yeah. yeah. So this is how you do an engine run and get it up to full power mm. uh, rather than turn it over onto its nose or keep the brakes on. Yeah, it's a nice angle, that. And then we move on to some aerial shots. Um, Again, you can see I, I, I kept that uh, tube on the back um, for a few months. Uh, that's over, I, th- I went up to 15,000 feet, but that's probably about seven or 8,000 feet. It's probably on one of my journeys up to um, Oki to go and fly so the So what Hunter. was the camera ship on these? Uh, this was Mike in his... Um, Is that Jeppero you said? Yeah, there was a Jabiru and there was also another light open. I can't remember the name of it oh, now. Okay. It had a, a side-by-side with a bubble canopy over yeah. the top with a little bit more yeah, uh, photograph, photographic. And uh, open canopy. I did a lot of uh, test trials with um, practising getting out of the cockpit a la Second World War Spitfire pilot. Yeah. You know, uh, sliding the canopy back, seeing what the air was like. Mm. And then one of them, I just sort of practised sort of standing up. <laughs> Oh, right. with the bird, just to see if I could go over the side, but and that was yeah. Another it. nice one of you uh, looking out the side towards the camera, and this last one, I've, I've really nice photograph. That it's lovely. Going away. Uh, see how clean it is. The, the it wing. is beautiful. And you'll notice that the scoop underneath there. That's uh, it's an air cooled engine, the Jabiru engine, mm. and the, the later ones. You know, these got water and all the other just, but the the fiberglass moulding on the top of the engine c- compartment, which was a a curve sitting over the top of the engine allowed all the air to go through and then right the way round the engine and out the back. The Jabiru engines did have a problem with the heat soaking uh, along the top of the engine, the aluminium engine, mm. to where the electrics were and the carbies were, uh, and it required quite a bit of engineering for Mike to to get that engine to cool. It's typhoony that bit, isn't it? Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a good photograph. Lovely wing. Another area what shot from the same session, I think, in it, yeah. Yeah. Quite a bit of um, uh, pho- photography was taken with undercarriage lowering. You'll see it on the videos of these, yeah. um, which is quite a lot of the early days. But ele- if you look under YouTube about 11, 13 years ago, you'll see us in the doing uh, airborne undercarriage lowering and flap and this sort of thing. All right, so concluding, I think... Um this is a really nice shot as well of the engine. Drop, um, yeah, look at that. Exhaust now, these here. two exhausts at the front are fake. Oh, right, okay. Right, so if you... Th- those two there, James put on to make it look like a 12-cylinder engine. The four behind it yeah. are actual exhausts. But they're, the, the actual machining or the yeah, the, the welding of getting those stainless steel stubs on were, were quite 
quite clever, whereas yeah. the front two are fake. Well, it looks great, and obviously the open <laughs> ducks behind the... There's pocket. the duck there. I remember making that with a, another gentleman in foam and then putting the fibreglass on and getting the mould and everything. Uh, later on, of course, that disappeared. We went on to the Isuzu and the V8. So. Yeah, so now we've sort of come to the end, Rick, so... Mm. One day you're going to fly a real Spitfire or go to a real maybe. Spitfire? Maybe, yeah, maybe. I, 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 I've, <laughs> got a, I've got a friend who keeps sending me pictures. No of, names mentioned. No names mentioned, yeah. Who's, who keeps um, saying, look, I've done this and I've just flown in a Mustang and I've just It'd be the icing this. on the, the cake for your career, really, wouldn't it? Just uh, <laughs> it would Or a hurricane. I'll save up, yeah, I'll save yeah, up. Yeah, not bad. Um, so uh, when did this all sort of finish then? When did you start working with them and uh, well, did the flying uh, or just when you moved from Mars back to UK or whatever? Or? Yeah, um... It has, but then it's sort of started again now. Yeah. When I've, I've gone across to Hendridge and seen one and showed them that Never gone a few away. things. Yeah, And obviously I, there's investigation on the incident recently as well. You've... Uh, yes, I offered that. But, you know, one never really knows what exactly happened. And I think a lot of people, he was quite a nervous, I think he was a little bit nervous flying it. And it, it's a shame, but I, I was very lucky in that I had flown, mm. you know, chipmunks and tiger moths. And obviously... And, on your fantasy island that we mentioned in one of your podcasts. Oh, yeah, did I? You're going to have the uh, mega-powered one of these, aren't you? Yes, I think I would have the V8. Um, I'd like <laughs> I'd like that. Uh, having flown it and flown all the different ones, uh, I think there's something about being able to, you know, climb at that sort of speed and have the power. But I think I've always contradicted myself here because the Isuzu, which is a truck engine, mm. really, it was so... And, of course, we had a computer. We had all this, and you could look and see how much stress had been on the engine after the flight. You plugged it into your computer. Yeah. And it was literally only working at about 55 60% no, you know, right, stress. Good, isn't it? So, so, you know, and it was beast then, really. very economical. It didn't matter where you put the throttle. It never overheated. Yeah. Everything about that particular engine, the Isuzu. So common sense would say the Isuzu, but for sure, Yahoo, I think I'd go for the V8. For the hooligan bit. Yeah, the hooligan bit. Well... Thank you very much, Rick, ah, for your <laughs> Spitfire <laughs> experience. Away, yeah. And yeah. Um, hope everybody enjoyed it. Obviously, you can subscribe and like and look at uh, the playlist because there's a lot of chat for Rick in his various adventures. Uh, there may be more coming up. Who oh, knows? No, 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 but no. Uh, we might put you to rest for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> in a box. Good. Cool. Well, thanks very much. That's and a pleasure. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. And uh, no. speak to you soon. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers, Keith.